to roll out new technology. Not only do you need a technology that works, you need a business model that works. The next speaker has made great success with a business model for solar power. He was also the first leader of Sir Richard Branson's Carbon War Room. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jigar Shah. Thank you very much for having me. For those of you who uh, just heard uh, Thomas speak, you can imagine that uh, the reasons for why we do what we do are plentiful. I think the question really becomes, is this really just a moral cause, or can we prove that this is the largest wealth creation opportunity on the planet? So the question becomes, for those of you who are old enough, I think many of you can think back to 1999, that that was a year when most people thought that we were actually doing pretty well, that poverty was coming down, people were getting jobs, that the world was looking better. What was different in 1999 compared to today? In the US, the blue line is inflation from energy, and the red line is inflation from energy from 1999 to 2013. You can see that the amount of money that the poor and the middle class are spending today versus what they were spending in the past is greatly different. In 1999, since 1999, the US pays 600 billion more for oil per year and 200 billion more for electricity. That's almost $7,000 more per household per year. Globally, that number is $2.5 trillion more annually, and one, point tr one trillion more for electricity, $1,200 average per household. And it doesn't have to be this way, because since the 1970s, we actually invested in technologies to solve just this problem, because we had the Arab oil crisis back then. If you don't care about technology deployment, though, what about healthcare costs? When you think about the healthcare costs in the US, $120 billion of actual documented health care costs per year from people's reactions to particulate emissions and other emissions from asthma. And if you further don't care about health care, what about water? 50% of all the fresh water withdrawals globally, not only in the US, are used for cooling coal plants, nuclear plants, and other thermoelectric plants around the world. So the next time someone tells you to shut off the faucet while you're brushing your teeth, tell them, no, let's just shut down the coal plant next door. <laughs> Most of you have seen this curve before. It's the McKinsey cost curve. But most of you are fixated, I would say, on solar and wind, because this is the, these are the technologies that everyone knows we are succeeding at now. Today, 200 billion, roughly, per year is going in profitably into deploying solar and wind. But we actually have buildings, transportation, and manufacturing also on the left side of the cost curve, where it's cost effective without a price on carbon. Land use, carbon capture, and other innovations coming up soon. What you see by this, though, is that due to continuous technology innovation, 50% of carbon emissions will always be profitable to offset. What we're hold, what's holding us back is not the technology. What's holding us back is our inability to pursue business model innovation and financial innovation. So how do we do this in solar? In solar, we did it because we had local advocates that are strong and powerful. This is something that I can't stress enough to you. At the time at which you decide to put in a solar policy in Norway, or the Netherlands, or Germany, or South Africa, the number of people who come out in support for this policy outnumbers the number of people who are in support of energy retrofits for buildings by 10 to 1. The reason why we have solar winning and ESCOs failing in the US and around the world is not because energy efficiency doesn't pay, it's because energy efficiency is boring. 
So the question becomes, how do we make energy efficiency less boring? Second, we have ever-improving technology. So politicians, others, they believe today that solar power can be provided cost-effectively without subsidies for over 20% of all the global electricity that's now supplied. Thirdly, we have thousands of salespeople. If I were to tell you this year, solar is gonna deploy $100 billion, you would be shocked. If I were to further tell you that globally, new power technologies being deployed for the generation of power will only be 400 billion a year. So solar is actually 25% of all of the money being invested per year this year and going forward in power electricity uh, generation technologies, I think you would be astounded. That's more than is going into new coal, more than is going into new nuclear, more than is going into new natural gas power generation. And that size is coming in at less than 30 kilowatts, which means that each system is less than 100,000 US dollars each. So you could imagine to reach $100 billion in $100,000 projects, you would need thousands of sales and marketing people, which is what we have in the solar industry. Now, we have opportunities that abound in all of the climate change solutions areas, from buildings, from industry, from waste, from land use, and from transport. Further, you can actually break it down even more in agriculture, livestock, biochar, forests. So let's get back to oil, $2.5 trillion per year that we're spending extra. We have the technologies because in the 1970s we had the Arab oil crisis and we all spent billions of dollars on the technology. A 10% reduction in demand reduces oil price by 50%. That means efficiency matters. This is low weight, uh, low weight materials for our vehicles, carbon fiber, aluminum, other materials. This means better engine technology, whether it's a better internal combustion engine or whether it's uh, an electric vehicle or an alternative fuel vehicle. We have oil replacement fuels. We have things like methanol, dimethyl ether, dimethyl methoxy. We have ethanol. All of these technologies exist, and all we have to do is to target 10% of all of the oil demand globally to reach a 50% reduction in oil price. Here's some other technologies on heavy trucks. This data comes from the Carbon War Room as well as from the Rocky Mountain Institute. You can see that this problem has been studied. The problem is not the fact that it hasn't been studied. The problem is not that the technology is not available. The problem is, is that for a tractor trailer, it's $84,600 of capital cost. And you can imagine if you own a tractor trailer, you don't really feel the need to invest that money to get that money back, even if the break-even price is a dollar a gallon for diesel. Now, the break-even prices are different, but what we invented at Sun Edison, the company I started, which is today deploying two and a half billion dollars a year of solar, is the no money down technique, where someone, an investor, pays for the costs of that upgrade and gets paid back as you save. It's the pay as you save model. This technique can be used in battery storage, it can be used in solar hot water, it can be used in many areas. What about electricity? Even today, 5% of global electricity is still generated using diesel and oil. Today, in, in parts of Africa, parts of India, this means that the cost of power from those technologies is about a dollar a kilowatt hour. You can imagine at a dollar a kilowatt hour, there are a lot of technologies that are cost effective without subsidies. 1% reduction in global demand is possible from energy efficiency. How? We need to abandon the notion of, of deep retrofits. Energy efficiency is not a technology, it's 25 technologies. It's HVAC technologies, heating and ventilation technologies, it's windows, it's heat pumps. Each of those technologies is possible to do. Continuous commissioning for buildings. Today, most buildings are operated badly. Because of the internet and the cloud, you now can have someone located 500 miles away operating your building for you in a much more efficient fashion and that is generating 10 to 28% savings. So we need to start going after the things that are hugely profitable, the things that actually create the largest wealth creation opportunity on the planet. 
So I come to my overarching plan. The International Energy Agency says that we need $10 trillion of incremental investment between now and 2020 to stave off the worst impacts of climate change. The good thing is they've also published 4,000 pages of documents telling you exactly where you can do it profitably and cost effectively. So let's break it down into something we understand. We need 100,000 businesses globally selling $100 million worth of good stuff by 2020. That means in Europe we need 100,000 salespeople who can use their circle of trust to sell $10 million worth of climate change solutions by 2020. So that would be a trillion dollars for Europe. We need about a trillion dollars in the US. And the rest of the eight trillion would go into Asia, Latin America, and Africa because they have big growth needs. The good news is that the IEA is saying that 44,000 of those businesses are already on track, that we actually already have them dialed in. So we have 56,000 businesses to go. What I deem this is the largest wealth creation opportunity on the planet. And it's not something that requires new technology. It's something that requires a new outlook on how we actually reach it. Just to look at it by business sector, most of us believe that the power part will be solved. The renewable electricity is moving quickly. The parts that are most behind today, transportation, buildings, the two areas that Norway can lead the most in because its electricity is already mostly decarbonized. And so the building sector and the industry sector and the transport sector is where we're really focused. And like I said, the good news is the technologies already exist. Thank you very much.